those who are with us today by automobile. And we have a few, that a skeleton crew that's running for us uh, this service so we can be live streaming to our people and others who want to visit with us. So we, we welcome you through the internet uh, to be part of our service today. Uh, we're, uh, we've stepped away from our study on spiritual gifts during this time of crisis. And we're dealing with uh, a series called uh, Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled. And uh, want to pray for our nation. Uh, that uh, the leadership uh, from the top down, uh, it looks to me like they've done a, a, a wonderful job of keeping us informed and and uh, being, being as truthful, I suppose, as they can without creating panic. Uh, on a state level, it looks like we've done the same thing. On a local level, uh, being in Birmingham, Alabama, being in the, one of the larger cities in the state uh, with um, a lot of uh, colleges and international students and, and an airport uh, that reaches across America and, uh, and outside. Uh, we've got more cases here recorded than probably most places but all probably major cities, Atlanta and other great cities out there are having the same problem we're having uh, uh, battling this virus. Our, our local church seems to be doing well. I've gotten no reports personally uh, of anybody within our congregation, and we're thankful for that. So we want to pray today for our nation, our state, uh, our county, and our city. And we also want to pray for the church international the Christian church has a great opportunity because this virus has hit the whole world. And, uh, and where it's not touched, it will touch. It's just a matter of time for it to make its circuit uh, around the globe. And uh, the church, like ours, will have a great opportunity, a, a trying time for a church. The Christian churches and the 501c people out there are in trouble financially. If you've supported uh, these 501Cs that have great Christian ministries and great support systems and your local church, let me tell you, you should support them. Uh, we haven't held church service for, for weeks and, and probably won't until they, they lift this so our people can come. We have uh, a large congregation of elderly who have respiratory problems and such as that. And so we, we, you need to be mindful of it. We need to pray every day. The Christian church has a great opportunity for great ministry across the world uh, with this virus. And so we want to pray for our Christian brothers out there and, and then for the families of our church. I don't know of any needs. I hope those who are listening to us from our church level, uh, if you have needs, you should let us know. You should check our board of deacons or, or one of our staff pastors uh, you can check with Al or Tony or Ernie or myself or the Board of Deacons. Uh, put it on our prayer line. Make us aware of it. We're certainly going to pray all this time. So, you know, this. I'm going to uh, I'm going to post things on our on our uh, on our uh, uh, prayer line. So pay attention to that uh, along the theme of letting out your hearts be troubled. Al's got a Bible study on Sunday nights. Five to six, uh, they're still meeting, practicing all the safe guards for you. You know, I, we've held our school of biblical theology. We practiced all the, all the things you're supposed to practice at, uh, uh, during this time. The one thing we know about the disease, it doesn't float in the air. It goes, goes from contact. And uh, so they tell you, you know, keep your hands washed, don't touch your face, and all these kind of things. Uh, it's about social distancing. They really hit that right when they talked about social distancing. But that's only part of it. The other part is hand contact, face hand contact. They see where it's going through the eye, the nose, and the mouth now. Um, so we're practicing all those things and still trying to have ministry. This virus is an invisible. The president calls it an invisible Listen, the Christian church fights the invisible war every day of our life. It's the angelic conflict. No matter if it's disease, death, or whatever it is, we fight it every day of our life. When he called invisible war, I went, hey, I know that. I'm a soldier of that. 
I fight the invisible war. <laughs> My church fights it every day. And, uh, and we're proud to be soldiers of the cross in regard to that. So let's have a word of prayer, and I'll get into my morning study out of John 14, 27. Let not your hearts be troubled, nor fearful. Let us pray. You know the protocol uh, to proper Bible study and prayer, uh, filling ministry of the Holy Spirit, and then according to the will of God, he will hear it, he will answer it, he will do it in his time for your benefit. So I give you a moment of silence to confess sin if necessary, out of carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sins, back into spirituality, the indwelling powerful ministry of the Holy Spirit that will teach and recall the word of God to our life at all times. Even in the night, he will wake you up. He will put people on your heart to pray for. He will recall things in your life that need to be addressed. It's an amazing ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit as he works with the Word of God under the principle of Hebrews 4.12, a critic. The Word of God becomes a critic in thought of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So, Father, we thank you for 1 John 1, 9, a principle that tells us if we confess our sins, we're out of carnality and back into spirituality where the great power ministry of the Holy Spirit is in the church age. Jesus said, I go away. Everybody got upset. He said, I don't see why you're upset. The Holy Spirit will come and take my place. And he will take it in your heart. He will dwell with inside your body of every believer and make your body the temple of God. You'll be a mobile church. And you'll be a powerful asset to the kingdom of God. How thankful we are we to march those orders today and not the orders of fear. We walk to the order of faith. Faith, not facts, faith. Faith, faith. What conquers the world? Faith. Faith is a victory that conquers the world. Faith. <laughs> In the church, we talk about faith. And what is the object of our faith? That's vitally important. We'll see it today. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit, minister the truth through this hour of study. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we are. Last Sunday, let me do a review because we're in a series called Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled Until the Virus Is Over. So you want to keep, keep tab every week. I'm going to throw something up on our website. I'm, I'm going to do something on Wednesday. I'm not quite sure how, how, whether I, I do it and put it on the our prayer network or do it from home or how we're going to do it. But I will give you another lesson on Wednesdays during the week, a midweek uh, sermon to encourage you, let not your heart be troubled. Last Sunday, we introduced a new series entitled, Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled, take from John 14 and from the Upper Room Discourse. Now, what a lot of people don't understand is that a lot of times people will refer, and I do often, the Upper Room Discourse, cha chapters 13 through 17. I, I call it the Upper Room Discourse. Technically, that's not true. It is true that that, uh, that started there. But when you study, you're not going to find that to be. When you study chapters 13 and 14, it's the Upper Room Discourse. But I want you to see something. Look at verse 30. Fourteen. Oh, verse the last verse, the last verse of chapter fourteen. When he gets through saying, he says, "Arise, watch this. Arise, let us go from here." Do you see that? Fourteen thirty-one at the very end of that verse. Now we know they're at the upper. We know they're at the Last Supper in the upper room. We know that. Because we, we read that in chapter 13. In chapter 13, now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew the hour had come to depart uh, and during the supper, 13, 14. You see that? See that? Chapter 13, verse 1. Now we're at chapter 14, and this is the upper supper. It goes all the way through the end of chapter 14. Agreed? Do you see that, Marion? See? Chapter 13, verse 1, then he gets, into the, uh, he, get, he gets into the Last Supper, and then he, he says, let's arise and let's go. So 
that is technically the upper room discourse. That occurs at the Last Supper. By the way, the Last Supper is the Last Supper of Jesus. Uh -huh. and, and truthfully, when he dies on a cross, it's the last Passover supper period. <laughs> so the Last Supper, it wasn't the Last Supper of the disciples, but it was the Last Supper of the Lord. Now, when we get to chapters 15 through 17, we call that the Mount of Olives Discourse. The Mount of Olives Discourse. That's what we call that. Because they're going somewhere. They're going somewhere. And when you read Matthew, I want you to go to Matthew with me a moment, just to get you into the geographical what's going on. In Matthew 26, 30, this story picks up. It's the same story going on. Matthew gives us insight. Matthew 30, uh, Matthew 26, 30. Let me find Matthew 26, 30. The supper's over. Now, when they get through this, they, if you have a study Bible, the, the Lord's Supper has been instituted. Now, when we get down to verse 30, after, the, after, after, after singing a hymn, Last Supper, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So when he says, Arise, let us go in John, where'd they go? They went to the Mount of Olives. And chapters 15, 16, and 17 is what we call the Mount of Olives discourse. And he gets into some, in chapter 15, 16, 17, he gets into some really heavy doctrine. I mean, really heavy teaching. You remember in chapter 13 and 14, what he does is he's answered questions of the disciples. The four, four disciples asked questions, and everything he taught was off from those four questions. Remember that? That's last week's lesson, by the way. Uh, I can't teach it all. I'm just reviewing. Now look at chapter 18. I'll go back to John with me. So we're out at the, uh, agreed we're at the Mount of Olives? Are we in agreement? Yes. We're in agreement. Now, when he, when he gets through the Mount of Olives discourse, which is chapter... 15, 16, 17, look at verse 18, 1. When Jesus has spoken these words, are you with me? These are the words of chapter 15, 16, 17. He went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden. Now, what do we think we call that garden? Gethsemane. It, now we're in Gethsemane. We're in the garden of Gethsemane, right? Where he has this great prayer. And then he's arrested. And I put this down. Then he's arrested, uh, betrayed and arrested, right? He, in the Last Supper, he talked about betrayal. It actually come to pass. Same night. <laughs> We're in the same night. But where did the betrayal take place? It actually took place in the garden when he was arrested. And everybody, you know, everybody was done, right? He was betrayed. And so sometimes I think at least as a student of the word, it helps to know where you are in, in chapters 13 through 17 and what he's teaching and, and what's going on. And so I wanted to give you a quick, quick review because a lot of times you'll hear us uh, as teachers, we'll just refer to this great period of time, chapter 13 through 17, and we'll call it the Last Supper or something like that. The truth of the matter is the, law, the Last Supper was 13, 14, where he answered the questions of four disciples about where you're going and what, we don't get it. Uh, to chapter 15, 16, 17, where he gets into really heavy theology that affects the church. Chapters 15, 16, 17 is all about the Holy Spirit coming and taking his place. All right, so I, I need to make sure, because I'm in chapters 13, 14, I want to give you a preview because this is really important uh, that you get a sense of where you are in discussion. This series of lessons that we're going to teach on Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled will address how spiritually advancing believers such as yourselves should respond, should respond to the 2020 COVID-19 crisis. It has, it has hit Everywhere. And it eventually sweep the world. We haven't had a virus like this maybe ever. 
tell you the truth, ever. This, this will make history. This virus will make history. And when it's all over, said, and done, because we are America and we believe in God and God does mighty and great things, we will lead a wonderful medical new era of medicine. When this virus is over, America will lead the way in getting the world, we will come up with uh, getting the world, medical world online, how to beat this thing. And what will come out of this medically will just be phenomenal. It was like when we went to the moon, we had no idea how many things would come from just the travel to the moon and back. Think how many things have come beneficial to our society having gone to the moon and back. You know, if you're just going to go to the moon, which we wanted to do, but what we got from it had nothing to do with the moon other than traveling there and back. And we'll find the same thing. I'm confident we always do. And America will lead the charge. We've got a president that understands that. And we're fortunate to have this guy with, with all of the things that people don't like about him they should, there are a lot of things they should like about him. He's a take charge guy, and you need him in a time of crisis. And, and we're fortunate to have that. We, we all would like to see a different tone, but that's not who he is. He's a New Yorker. You spend any time in New York, everybody's like that. They are take charge people. Whether right or wrong, they do. <laughs> And so sometimes he's right with us take charge and sometimes he's wrong, but he's right now. And we're, I, I am thankful for it. I like a leader like that. So what we're going to do through this series is to give you tools to cope. Every day you got to cope. You know, if, if, you still, if you still got a chance to go to work or, or working from home, you shouldn't complain because you're part of the solution. Keeping the engine running in America is so important. We're an industrial, high-powered industrial nation. We're a high-powered industrial nation by the grace of God. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. God just gave it to us. And you got to keep that engine running. We're, we're the breadbasket, the breadbasket of the world. Think about that. Not only the bread basket, the medical basket, the industrial basket, we're the free enterprise source. The only thing that keeps free enterprise, which is a great divine institution, the only thing that keeps this running is America. If it wasn't for America, there would be no free enterprise system out there running, except some little farmer someplace that understands it. This is a marvelous thing, and some great and marvelous things. And so I want to, what I want to do is I want to give you the tools. As Christians, I want to, I want to equip you for this task, and I will, I, will, I will do that. I am confident that I can do that, and I will do that for you. If you will keep tuned in with us, I will give you the tools necessary to make this a joyful journey. You can make this a miserable journey or a joyful journey. It's a choice. The other day, I was in the doctor's office. Yeah, I was actually in a doctor's office. God bless him. And he, he, he used all the protocol. I pulled up in my car. I waited for a call. I got a call. I went into the office. They practiced all the safety. I went to talk with him. And from there, I went to another place uh, where I was going to be. And there was two of us in a room with about 10 feet apart. And we were getting medically treated. I looked over to the guy over there, and I said, what kind of a day are you having? He said, not a good one. I said, well, why is that? And so he, told, he started his whine, what I call a whiny story. I said, well, you know what? I got something to tell you today, if you don't mind. And he said, what's that? I said, I love this verse out of Psalms 118. This is the day the Lord has made. He said, I know that verse. I said, you do? He said, yeah, I know that verse. I said, then finish it for me. So he, he does have what well, a lot of us have to. He had to go back to the beginning. This is the day the Lord has made. Oh, he said, let us rejoice and be glad in it. 
I said, then why are you sitting 10 feet, 10 feet away from me whining? I see sadness over you. You said this, I'm having a bad day. How is that possible? How is that possible for you to be 10 feet away from me and you having a bad day in Christ and I'm having a great day? Why is that possible? He said, well, I don't know. That's a good question. I said, well, that's why I'm 10 feet away from you, but why we're together today. I'm going to tell you how to fix this. Because is either God is truthful about that or he's not. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It don't matter what day you see on your plate. I don't care if you think it's a good day or a bad day. It's the day the Lord has made for your life for you to rejoice and be glad in it because God is still in charge. God is still in charge. God is still in charge. You know what God is saying to the guy who says, I'm having a bad day? Here's what you got to say. God's got it. God's got it. And you need to be mindful of it. Last Sunday, we studied how the disciples of Jesus Christ were unwilling to deal with a common crisis in their life. They all have the same in crisis like we have. We have, all have the same virus crisis. They had the same crisis. Every one of the disciples, they were asking questions off the same problem. Yet they were unwilling to deal with the core problem because of old man, old man worldly cosmos thinking, like Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. We saw the same old man worldly thinking earlier with Peter when he was dealing with the crisis earlier in Matthew 16, 21 through 23, when Jesus had to say to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. Watch, for you are not setting your mind. You know you got to set your mind like your clock, like your watch today, or like your phone. Set your mind. It, you have to set your mind. I don't know how, people, how many people set their mind, but when you're having a bad day, you got to reset it, Right? I said to him, you got to reset your mind. What you told yourself today, as you sat in that chair 10 feet away, what you've told yourself is a lie. You've told yourself a lie and chose to believe it. Because it's not true. Psalms 118 says that's not true. Right? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And so... Here it is in Matthew 16, 23. Jesus tells him to reset your mind. Reset your mind. You're setting your mind on God, not setting your mind on God's interest. You're setting your mind on man's, on your own interest. You're not setting on God's interest. Reset your mind, church. Reset your mind. I'm having a bad day. Reset your mind. I'm having a bad marriage. Reset your mind. My kids are... My kids are raising hell. Set, reset your mind. Right? Reset your mind. That shouldn't affect you. It affects them. These are the choices they're making. Are you responsible? Not for their choices, but for correcting them. Right? You got to correct their problem. Set your mind. What he's telling us is to reset your mind. This, cry, cry, this, listen, who's in charge of this virus? I hope not the nation. Listen, God is like everything else in every day of your life. Who gave you the day? If you woke up and you got Monday, guess who gave it to you? If you wake up and you got Tuesday, guess who gave it to you? And if you don't wake up, you're better off because he gave that to you too. To be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. So what kind of a day am I having? The one the Lord has set for me. The one the Lord has set for me. Rejoice and be glad in it. Set your mind. If you're having a bad day, you're not having a bad day. You choose to have one. That's a lie. It's a lie. You can't have a bad day. Listen, every day is good because of God, Romans 8, 28. 
Why do we, why do we set our mind to think the worst? Because we think man's way. Man's way is the world's way. We also learned that it wasn't that they didn't have faith. But their faith was in the wrong object. You remember that? Their faith was in the wrong object. What he tells Peter, when he explains to Peter why he's, what he's, where he's, he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to be crucified, he's going to, three days later, going to be raised from the dead. Peter, it upset Peter. Rather than Peter reset his mind to think the way the Lord was true. Do you think the Lord's lying to you, Peter? No. Why, did, what did, why is Peter upset with the Lord? Because he's got a different premise, a different object for his faith. He wants a Messiah that's not going to die on a cross for the sins of the world, go, not going to go to the grave, and not be raised on the third day. That's the Messiah he wants. He wants a Messiah that will come and create a millennial kingdom, right? We know this. I taught it to you last week. Go back and review. He set his mind on the wrong object. Does Peter have faith? Yeah, faith in the wrong object. Do you understand that? Listen, when you have the wrong object, you're not going to get the right results. The wrong object is not going to give you the right results. It's not going to give you the right results. And so, all the disciples have the same problem. They believe something to be true that wasn't relevant to their crisis. Listen, what Peter believed was true, but it wasn't relevant to his crisis. He believed in a, the Messiah would bring a millennial kingdom. He believed the Messiah would bring a millennial kingdom without the cross, without the burial, and without the resurrection. That was not biblical. Every time Jesus tried to correct that false premise, they rejected his teaching. Right? Yeah, there's no doubt about this. I talked about it last week. Listen, when you have the wrong, if you have faith in the wrong object, then what you're believing, what you're believing would work, won't. It won't work because God doesn't support it. Right? It's God's word, his promise, he can do it. It's based on him, not on us. So we talked about that. Faith must have a working object, the doctrinal principle. Faith must have a working object. The working object for a believer is the truth, categorical Bible doctrine of the word of God. See, the disciples are struggling with categorical doctrine. Jesus saying, I got, I'm going to die for the sins of the world, I'm going to be buried and raised on the third day. They went, that don't fit my theology. That don't fit my theology. Their theology, it, doesn't, it wasn't that they didn't have faith. They had faith in the wrong object. Their object wasn't relevant for the crisis they were faced with. Do you understand that? It wasn't that they, listen, they had faith that Christ would come and establish a, a, a millennium, but this is not what's occurring. That's not what's on the plate. That's going to, listen, it's not even on our plate. <laughs> if you're looking for, to, put, to apply the millennial kingdom to this virus problem, it won't work. Your doctrine has to be relevant to the crisis that you're facing. Otherwise, it won't work. The working of the truth of the word of God works because it's based on the character of God, not on the character of man. He told us that in John 14, 1. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, faithful is he who calls you, and he, faithful is he who calls you, and he, God, the one who is faithful, will bring it to pass. Is that a promise? Hey, come on now. Is that a promise? How come we don't believe that? He will bring it to pass. Last Sunday, we learned that every time Jesus tried to point them towards the correct categorical doctrine of the crisis of their life in the Word of God, they rejected it because they didn't agree, they, it didn't agree with their false premise. Do you understand that? That's all of our problem. That's called the old man cosmos diabolicus thinking. 
And it's, you've got to reset your mind. You've got to reset it. You've got to get it off that kind of false thinking onto the categorical truth of your problem. What does the Bible say about the reality of your problem? What's the Bible say? And make sure it's correct. We learned all that from the Upper Room Discourse. Now today, what we're going to see is that from verse 1 of chapter 14 to, chap to verse 27 of chapter 14, the disciples' confusion and the trouble in their heart increased. Now, whatever they're believing is not working because their hearts are becoming more troubled and fearful. And they won't give up a false premise that is not working. I can't tell you how many Christians I meet, even in this church, that have the same problem. They're holding on to old beliefs that hinder their momentum. They're troubled in their spirit. They're fearful in their spirit. They're uptight because they've set their mind on worldly thinking. I call worldly thinking squirrely thinking. As the crisis increased in the disciples' hearts in chapters 13 and 14, the Last Supper, their hearts became more troubled to Rosso and fearful until confronted in verse 27. You know what Jesus did in verse 27? He confronted them. And by the time he confronted, you know why he confronted them? Look at verse 14.1. 14, Let not your hearts be troubled. Right? That's a negative may with a present passive imperative. Stop. It, he didn't mean let. He meant stop doing this to yourself. The passive voice means they were bringing this on themselves. They were causing a problem within themselves that was unnecessary. Self-induced misery. But watch what he said in verse 27 because they wouldn't correct it. And he tried to get them to correct it. Third, he answered all their questions scripturally and doctrinally in chapters 13 14. Look what he said in verse 27. Look what he said in verse 27, 14, 27. I got to come back to 14. 14, 27. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, nor let it be fearful. I want you to see two things. This time he said, stop, stop. He didn't say start. He said start at the beginning. He gave them the antidote at the beginning. And he said, you better start listening to me. I'm going to give you the antidote to the virus. And you need to listen to me. I'm going to give it to you. Because what has happened between verse 1 and 27 is their hearts become what? They went from being troubled to what? Being fearful. Now, this word, dileo, in the Greek language, refers to be, it's like a sea that is out of control, and you're in a ship on it. This, it's a turbulent, crazy sea that could take a ship down and expert sailors with it. A turbulent sea that's out of control, or you might say in control of whatever's on it. The sea has become turbulent, and whatever's on the sea, the sea is in control of it. No matter how much engine power you got, no matter how expert a steerer you have of the ship, they can't do anything with it. Are you with me? That's the word. That's the word fearful. That is the word fearful. And that's why I call, in other words, I want to talk today. Notice this time he put the antidote at the first. Peace I leave with you. 
My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. In other words, not a work system, it's a grace system. And then he addresses the, the, the virus. He addresses the problem that they're faced with. Let not your hearts be troubled. Now they've become fearful, and now i got to address the fear. I addressed the problem, you wouldn't listen. Now I have to address your fear. Are you with me? So what did he give? What was the antidote? Well, here we go. Let's take a look. Look, look, look. Here's what we know about the virus we have right now. you got to have the right vaccine to correct the problem. If you're going to be able to have a cure, you got to have a, a correct vaccine. We're struggling with that right now. We've got some that we think might help, but we don't have the confidence to say, take that and you're done. Right? We don't have that. You got to have that. So what is the, what is the correct va uh, antidote to a troubled, fearful heart? Here it is, the peace of Christ. There it is. There it is, point number one. In John 14, 1, in John 14, 1, he gave the first antidote. Now, there's, there's three of them. In this lesson, there are three antidotes to this problem of a troubled, fearful heart. The first antidote was given in verse 14, uh, verse 1 of chapter 14, when he said, the antidote, he said, believe in God and believe in Christ. How do you treat a troubled heart? A heart that's just gone crazy. The, his thinking has just gotten wild like a turbulent sea that's in control. How are you going to deal with it? You got, listen to me. You got to find some, who is the one who's greater than the sea? Who's greater than the sea? God. You know why? Because he made it. Why Christ? Because he has power over it. How do I know that Christ has power over a turbulent sea? Well, in Mark, the fourth chapter, in Mark, the fourth chapter, 35 to 41, well worth your read. You ought to write that down. I doubt if I put it on your paper. Mark 4, Jesus and his disciples had a, had a busy day at work. They were in a ship going to another location, and he went to sleep on a pillow. He got a, got a pillow, crawled up in a corner over there, not because he was sick, but because he was tired. Went to sleep. And the sea became turbulent so that they all become fearful that, they were, that they, nobody could control the ship. The sea controlled the ship. When the sea controlled the ship, they were out of control. When they were out of control, they panicked, like many of us. When we're out of control of our ship, we panic. The truth of the matter, what you should do is go to the one who is over it. Would you agree with that? Oh, you say that's too simple a solution. Well, that's the first place you got to go. Who created the sea is in control of the sea. He says, you, if you, if, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. And he makes a command, believe in God. Then he makes a second command, believe in Christ. Why? You're going to see that Christ has authority over whatever God created. Whatever God created, Christ is an authority over Every day he created, everything he created, Christ is now an authority over him. And he proved it before he ever left the earth. The peace, the peace of Christ was shown in the story of Mark 4. When they got up, they woke him up in the midst of the storm. When they could, when they, the boat was out of control and they were out of control, they woke him up. And they said, do you not care that we are perishing? Typical wine butts. Of course he cares. Of course he cares. Of course he cares. Did he not go to the cross and die for you? Was he not buried and raised from the dead? For Of course he cares for you. Of course he cares for you. He cares for more than your troubled, fearful heart. Of course he cares for you. And to show that he had authority over what God created, what did he do? He stood up and told the sea to be quiet and be calm. Here's the point of the lesson that they didn't get. When the sea got calm, 
How did their hearts become? Calm. You know when Jesus' heart was calm? When he was asleep on, the, uh, on a pillow in a storm because God is in control. I'm not going to die one day earlier than what God is selected. God's in control of my life. They didn't get that picture there. When he came to the sea, they said, wow, he has power over the sea. This is the same group of guys we're dealing with in Matthew 14. <laughs> They missed the lesson. Don't you miss it. All that God created, Jesus is in charge of. He has authority over it. In Matthew, the 8th chapter, a centurion came to Jesus and he said, I have a servant at home that's become absolutely paralyzed and I think he's going to die. Jesus said to him, listen, I will go immediately and heal him. The centurion says, no, you don't need to do that. I, like you, am a man of authority. When I speak, it gets done. I'm a centurion. Anybody under my command, I can give them a command as from on high, and it gets done. I believe you're that kind of man with God. Just speak the word. Just speak the word. I believe you're that man of God. Just speak the word, and my servant will be healed. The Bible says, when the servant got home, the centurion clocked it in when he said, it's done. When the centurion got back to the place, to his residence, he noticed that the servant was healed the very moment Jesus spoke the words. Jesus said, I have, net, I have never seen a greater faith in all of Israel. Think about that. Matthew, the 8th chapter. I have never seen a greater faith. Listen to me now. You're going to miss it because you're not paying attention. You're going to miss this. Where did the centurion get this faith that was greater than all of Israel. When he saw in his heart that Jesus was the man of God that had authority with God, that he had, Jesus Christ had the authority of creation, that he could speak and his servant's body be healed. The body that was created by God out of the dust of the earth and breathed Nisha Mahayim into his, into his lungs, and his soul became alive, and he became a human being. That is the same Jesus Christ that we serve today. He is nothing less, he is more. He is nothing less, he is more. He said to them, listen, the first antidote to your problem, to a troubled heart, is to believe in God. He's the creator of all things. He is in charge. Take it to the Lord. How many times do you hear it? Take it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord. You believe? Believe God. God is in control over everything. And you know what? Believe this, that he put Jesus in authority over everything he created. That's your job. You know who created your job? You didn't create it, nor did the company that you work for. They didn't create that job. They didn't create it. This is free enterprise, divine institution, free enterprise. The reason they're still in existence and why? Because Well, they have a good product. They have good things. They have good... No, no. Listen, the bottom line is God created it. Free enterprise, free enterprise has been created by God and to, and to God be the glory. To God be the glory. Listen, your business is no different than the farmer who plants it and waits on God to give him the increase. Business. Yeah, it was your, your, your company's not a genius. They picked up on divine institu principles of divine institutional free enterprise ideas, and they've, that's why your company's still in existence. 
You ought to be thankful for it. You ought to pray for them every day that they stay in line with divine and do things. You know when they're out of line. You know absolutely when they're out of line. You ought to pray for it. Get back in line. Get back in line. We have a great company. It's a divine institutional. God is blessing us. I don't know. He gives a second antidote. There's the first antidote. Here's the second antidote is in verse 27, John 14, 27. The second antidote to a fearful heart. First one was a troubled heart. Believe in God, believe in Christ. Here's the second one, peace of Christ. I find it really interesting how he introduced this subject to his disciples. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Therefore, he gave two negatives. Do not, do not let your hearts be troubled. A present passive imperative, he says, stop doing this. Stop doing this to yourself. You're producing self-induced misery. Stop doing that. It's like that man over there. Listen, when he got up, we got up and walked out. We, we waved because we can't hug. We'd have hugged if we could have. But we couldn't hug. We can't hug anymore for a while. When that man got up, he was a different guy that sat down. You know why? Because he reset his mind. Reset his heart. This is the day of the Lord. He said, I knew that verse. I knew that verse. What? Why? I know that verse. I said, I know. God sent me your way just to remind you. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe in Christ. Listen, everything God created, he's in charge of. Do you believe that? You ought to. He's sitting at the right hand of God with all authority on heaven and earth. <laughs> Come on. Come on, people. I love that. Peace, I leave with you. When Jesus Christ left the earth, he didn't take peace with him. Listen to me. When he was in that boat, he stood up and he said, be still to the sea. He spoke to the sea and said to the sea, be still. And who does that? Who has that? Who can speak to water and the water obey? Listen, that's not one part of that water on the Sea of Galilee. The whole sea went, hey, the little ripple. Hey, get that out of there. Get, come on, get that. This is our Lord. This is the man who died on the cross and wants to be charged. He wants authority over your life. You've got to give it to him. Let not your hearts be troubled. Why don't you give that authority to him? You believe in God, believe in Christ. He's the Son of God with authority. Why wouldn't you pray to, in the power of his name? My, my, my. He says, I didn't take, I'm not, I'm not going to take my peace with you. I'm going to leave it with you. Don't you love it? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I love that. And then he says, do not let your heart, see the word nor, that's a not. When you have a may and a nor, when you have a not and a nor, you got a double negative. Come on now. You know that. Not nor. <laughs> Come on. Come on, people. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Stop doing that. You're creating self-induced misery. Nor let it be fearful. See? Stop doing that. You've let a troubled heart become fearful and who is miserable? You are. And will I have every right to be? No, you don't have one right to be. <laughs> well, if you knew what, what I was going through, I don't have to know what you're going through. I know who's gotten control of it. I don't have to know your personal problems for you to give it to Christ. I don't care what boat you're in or what sea you're on. I know who controls them. I don't have to know if it's Atlantic or Pacific. I don't have to know it. I don't have to know it. Note that Jesus didn't take his peace when he left this world. He left it with us. 
You know what the world needs now? You know what they need now? In this crisis, you know what they need? They need to believe in God, that he's the creator of everything. They need to believe that Christ is the son of God with authority over everything God created. And the antidote to a troubled and fearful heart is the peace of Christ. You know what, the, you know what irony means? It means inner tranquility. You know what inner tranquility means? I'm relaxed. Every muscle in my body is relaxed. Right? I can go to bed and sleep like a baby. I can enjoy my life. I'm not worried about it. I'm not going to fret about it. I'm not in control. You are in control of your heart. Right? But you're not in control of all the things your heart's thinking about. Peace. Inner tranquility. Inner tranquility. Wherever muscle in your body relaxes. You ever gone to a, you ever gone to a, if you ever, if it's somebody in your family maybe, reach up and, and, and touch you on the shoulder or something and go like, whoa, are you tight? You ever had anybody do that? Well, maybe not. Because when you get anxious and tense and all, everything, every muscle in your body does, doesn't it? That's why they tell you to take a good hot bath, <laughs> right? Try to get you to relax your body, the muscles in your body. You know where that's, that's coming from? It's coming from your, you know, it's a, who's, who's, who's in charge of that? Listen, the problems that, that you got, you're not dealing with is, is creating that. Listen, take the problems that are creating that and give them to the Lord because he, he, he's over them. He has authority over them. You understand? He has, he, has, he has authority over him, whatever it is. You say marriage, he's, he, he has power over marriage. You say health, he's got power over that. Everything that you're worried about, he has authority over. He's created all that, he has authority over it. Come on, people. Now, the third antidote is peace. The second antidote was peace. The peace of Christ, the inner tranquility of freedom. Freedom from worry, free, freedom from fear. The peace is the inner tranquility of freedom from a troubled and fearful heart. You ought to read Luke 8, 22 through 25. You know what Jesus kept trying to tell the disciples? Look, here's what he tried to keep telling the disciples. Who knew it? They've seen him work before. They've seen him in action. <laughs> I got it. As soon as they woke him up. <laughs> They woke him up. He went, I got it. He didn't say be calm. He says, I got it. Listen, he's always got it. He's always got it. Can I tell you that Jesus Christ always had it? That's why he can say, he's always got it, guys. That's why he can say, let not your hearts be troubled nor fearful. You know why? Because he's got it. He sets in the position of authority over everything that touches your life. Jesus Christ today at the right hand of God the Father sets with authority, with divine authority, God Almighty authority, over everything that touches your life. Nothing touches your life without permission. Nothing or no one. Now look, I got to close this thing down because I'm, I could, I, I'm revved up and ready to preach all day. This lesson is not addressing the peace with God to an unbeliever. It's addressing the peace of Christ to a believer. Like in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, both your spirit, your soul, your body. Think about that. Your spirit, peace in your spirit, Peace in your soul. Peace in your body. When you go to the peace of Christ, he's going to affect that peace. He's going to put peace in your... Look, he's going to put it on the ship, in the bow, in the rear. I don't know what the ship, all that stuff is called. 
But every section of the ship, if you're, if you're up there, the steering wheel in the, in the captain's chair is going to get peace. If he's down in the engine room, you're going to get peace. If you're in the bunks or the cook or the making dinner or whatever, you got peace. The inner tranquility of freedom from anxiety. Listen to me. The peace of Christ will affect your spirit, your soul, and your body. Now, one final point. Here is my third antidote. My third antidote, and I got to I got to quit. You know how you get it instantaneous? Look, look. When Jesus was in the ship, he was back there laying out a pillow, sleeping in a storm. Right? He go, I love storms. Right? He's he's saying he's asleep in his mind. You know when it, you get that nice soft rain, and you're ready to lay down and rest. And you lay down, and you can hear that rain. Isn't that soothing? Or, or if you're down at the ocean, like I am sometimes, and turn the air conditioner off, which is very seldom I can do, and open the doors and listen to the waves come in and out on that soft, steady system. Oh, I mean, that's the best sleeping in the world. Or if we got a hammock, Rick, we used to fight over the hammock we had on our front porch. Everybody wanted to take an afternoon nap there. So get that thing rocking, that breeze coming across, and listen to the waves. It's ching, ching, ching. Oh, my goodness, people. Oh, my goodness. Here it is. Listen to me. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. Every Christian is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The point of salvation makes his body the, the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. One of the fruit of the Spirit. Here, here is... Here is here is the secret of instantaneous help. Walk in the spirit, not the flesh. Here is the flesh. <laughs> That's the flesh. Here is the spirit of God. Peace. When you study the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, love, joy, love, joy, peace. You know what that is? Instantaneous. That's Jesus in the boat laying on his ship. And he gets up and he says, peace. Set your mind to the ministry of the Holy Spirit immediately because when your heart gets troubled and fearful, that's flesh. And you're aware of it. Immediately go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit who's in you. That's a mind thing. Switch, switch your mind off. Switch your mind off. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to give it to the man who's in charge. Well, who's in charge? Jesus is in charge. And he's in charge whether it's a calm day or a stormy day. I don't care if your boat's on the sea. A calm day, Jesus is in charge. I don't care if it's a storm, Jesus is in charge. The secret is Jesus is in charge. He's always in charge. Switch your mind off. You're not in charge when it's calm, and he's in charge when it's stormy. He's in charge when it's calm, and he's in charge when it's stormy. That's walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he will produce, supernaturally produce in you peace. The peace of Christ will supernaturally be produced in you. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The indwelling Holy Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit when a believer walks by means of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can supernaturally produce the peace of Christ in those moments when a believer's heart is troubled and fearful. You need to read Romans 8, chapter, verses 6 and 7, when it says, those in the flesh, carnality, can never please God. You need to be confident of Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know one of the great names that Isaiah has of Jesus Christ, a messianic title? Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace today as well as tomorrow. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for those who have attended our service with us 
by the automobile and the internet. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this lesson. Let not your hearts be troubled. We gave three antidotes that are vitally important this time of crisis. And if they learn it then this time, they will learn it. If they have a heart for the peace of Christ, the ultimate antidote or vaccine, we might say, to the troubled, fearful heart is the peace of Christ that can be produced instantaneously in any moment of any day of any crisis because Jesus wants us to know, I've got it. Just give it to me. I've got it. Give it to me. And he will calm the storm and we will have peace as a result. I pray, Father, we know that this peace that comes from the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life as well as the Word of God. And I pray that we would understand the front line, the front line ministry is walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the flesh, we cannot please God. In the Spirit, the peace of God will bring us to a place. We're appreciative of what you're doing in our life. For your sake, in Jesus' name, amen.